Nicodemus, a man, no man can see the kingdom of heaven except he be born again. He is that way. He is the life. Why? Because the Chaim, God, if God, listen, my brother, think about it like this. I know you don't want to accept it, but think about it and look at it and pray sincerely and earnestly and consider what I'm telling you. Adam sinned, Eve sinned, and it cut us off from the tree of life. The first time blood ever come on this earth was when God put Adam into a deep sleep and he opened up his side in order to take from Adam his wife and to make his wife. Now some people might say, well, it couldn't have been blood come on the earth. It had to be a bloodless operation. Hmm. I guess then it had to be a painless operation as well. What do you think? You know, for God had to put Adam into a deep sleep, it's because if he didn't, he was going to suffer a trauma to have his side opened up by God. But his side was opened up, no doubt. I don't say it was a lot of blood because, you know, when you open, you know, maybe it wasn't that much blood at all. But the thing is, is there was blood that came out on the ground. No wonder why you have to have a blood sacrifice for sin. Because why? God knew that when they sinned, that his side had been opened up. God went through a tremendous effort in order to bring forth Eve, his wife to separate them so that they could have fellowship just as, oh my God, this is, we had the fellowship with him. What did Jesus say? In that day you will know that I'm in the Father, the Father in me, and that I am in you. Adam was able to experience this because why? His wife was in him. And he was in God. And Christ was in God. And then he, he, was, he, he, he spoke that word, he came into eternity, come existing in our dimension. And then he was that tree of life in the Garden of Eden. He was able to breathe God's life into Adam and Eve. But when sin came in, the way to the tree of life had to be guarded and preserved. Why? Because now a sinful nature had come in because of this sinful nature, God had to block the tree of life. He could not have fallen men and women that would be born. The children, see, God had already told them, Poply, replenish, uh, you know, replenish the earth. Multiply and replenish the earth. So it didn't stop them from bringing forth children. But once he guarded the way of the tree of life because of sin, he knew he, he had to make a, a, a way of redemption. That the way was cut off. And God was guarding that way. And Adam and Eve were forced out of the garden. And they were forced into a land. I believe that it was actually literally from another dimension that they went into. To this earth. This earth is another dimension altogether from that where they were. And even when it says they were naked and they didn't know it. You know, not the perverted way that men try to make it now. You know, they paint some two people naked in a garden and everything. They were clothed in his glory. Totally different. Not a nakedness what you would think. Clothed with the glory of God. The Shekinah. Walking in that light. And all they could see was the word. But sin came in and interrupted the program. They did bring forth children. But because of sin, God had to make an atonement. This is why we have a morning time still yet to come. Because of the atonement. If God, in order to bring forth life, He had to open up Adam's side to bring out his wife. And then sin came in. And then the children were being born. And God could not impart chai, chai or chayim anymore to the children of, of God as they were being born on the earth. Because of sin, he had to begin to make that way of redemption. He had to make another Adam. When Moses smote the rock in the wilderness, the argument was over whether or not God was among them or not. After all the miracles they had seen, the plagues, uh, everything that happened in Egypt, the parting of the sea. And then Israel, after only two weeks of journey, because it, they, they, they don't find water, instead of trusting and believing God for the water, they're already complaining. 
And they look at Moses, you're just a washed up prophet. Is God really among us or not? And then when this man Yeshua come on the scene, what did he do? Raise the dead, heal the sick. The blinded eyes were open. And what ended up being the argument when he was brought down for judgment? This man makes himself, makes himself God. Because he says he's the son of God. So the question was, even then, is God among us or not? And so God had Moses go out with the elders of Israel and judge the rock. And he smote the rock, showing that what Israel, what our call as a chosen people, a priestly nation, we are chosen for what purpose? To offer sacrifice for sins. And so what, we, what are we to do? We are supposed to take, and when the rock came, we would take and we would judge him, not just us, but the elders of Israel, the priests, the Levites would take him and judge him, and he would be smitten. When he'd be smitten, the very thing that happened to Adam would happen to him. No wonder when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and it's kind of interesting when I say this story to you, because you know the Jews have always said in the time past that you're Jewish because your father is Jewish. Nowadays we say we're Jewish because our mothers are Jewish. You know, now that's kind of ironic there. For those of you that don't like Jesus' teachings, you took his teaching whether you realize it or not. Now I know we claim because of the Holocaust and things of that, and so many of our forefathers were killed in the Holocaust, and I share that in common, my mother's side of the family with 1,500 names on the Yad Vashem. But let me just say this to you. Do you realize that we took the very law that Jesus did and applied it as well? Because when Jesus went to the Samaritan woman, she said, we have no dealings with you because I'm a Samaritan and you are a Jew. And Jesus began to talk to her. He was sent to his own and said, therefore, as a woman of Samaria who became she was considered a Jew. Why? Because her mother was Jewish. Because Samaritans were, were, were erased because of the Assyrians that had, that had raped the Jewish women and bore children by them. And so she was one of those children, one of the descendants. But Jesus considered her a daughter of Israel, just the same. Because he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And so he goes to her. And they have a little theological debate. He asked her to bring him a drink. It's kind of interesting. You, you can't do it yourself. And she said, the well's deep, the carnality that we have. She said, the well is deep, and you have nothing to draw with. And he said, woman, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. Now, I'm just paraphrasing, so if I don't get it quite right, please forgive me. He said, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. And she says, uh, he said, I'd give you water that you don't have to come here and draw anymore. She said, sir, our father, you know, she goes into kind of still like a little bit of an argument. You know, our fathers, they, they, they dug this well. And are you any greater than they? Jesus says, go get your husband, come here. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you've told the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. She said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. But we know that when the Messiah comes, this is what he'll do. Very interesting. Do you ever think, my brother, what she meant by that? If you, if you read it, if you actually read the Christian text, she got that from Abraham. Abraham knew who Moshiach was, the anointed of his day, because when the Messiah came walking to his door that day, and God himself walked up in a human body, and he began to speak to Abraham, one, he knew what Abraham's name was. And then something very spectacular. Sarah, who was in the tent behind Abraham, laughed inside of her heart. And she said, me being old and my Lord being old, how could I have pleasure with my Lord again? Like that. 
And the very angel who Moses called Yehovah says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, how can these things be? And Sarah denied it and she said, I did not laugh. And he said, but you did. I find that very interesting. You see, what was it? He knew the secrets. Just as today, or excuse me, in the day of Jesus when he came on the earth, this is the whole reason why he did these things, was to prove that he was the same God that spoke to Abraham. That's why that when the question even comes up, they said, you're a man out of 50 years old, and you say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He claimed to be Ihaye. And you know, the funny thing is, is in Hebrew, when we say Ihaye, it means I will be that which I will be. Ihaye, Asha, Ihaye, I will be that which I will be, or that which I will prove to be. God proves Himself with signs and wonders. And He proved Himself then. And so the woman. She recognizes this, and when she did, when she seen that he knew everything about her, she dropped her water pot, she ran in the city, and she told everyone, she said, come see a man who's told me everything that I ever did. Well, she is a preacher, boy. I know that don't go over too good with a lot of men to hear that, but she did preach the gospel, and they believed her. Of course, when they came out and showed the little patriarchal society still kicking in there, when they said, we don't believe because of your testimony, but we heard for ourselves. You know, Jesus abraded them after his resurrection when he sent the women to go tell his disciples that he had risen and they didn't believe it because they were women. He abraded them for that. He said, why didn't you believe their testimony? Remember, my brethren, when God, when the fall came in the garden and he says to Eve, your husband shall rule over you, he wasn't given the man a reward for sin. He was prophesying to Eve what would happen because of carnality. Because of the losing of the Holy Spirit, they would no longer live by that standard any longer. Just like he said when, when <clears throat> Israel wanted a king, and they got a good king, got David, got Solomon. But he tells Samuel the prophet, remember when I told you earlier, I said, i would bring you back to this, they would reject him. They rejected God's provided way, Samuel. And we took a king. Hmm. Yeah, we took a king because we wanted a king instead. And God said to Israel, tell Samuel, he said, go tell him. This is what he's going to do with your daughters and with your sons. He, t he prophesied to them the attribute of their sin. But yet we did get good king. David, we got a good king with Solomon. Of course, Solomon goes out into idolatry with the women that he married. But he still was a godly king in the beginning. But here we are again. It's kind of interesting because we look at the, the, the situation with Israel right now and, and Benjamin Netanyahu doing the best that he can. Now we got Phelan who's also uh, with the Likud party who's wanting to step up to the plate there to prove that he can be the king of Israel as well. But unfortunately, neither one of them will work. Remember when it says over there, what is it in uh, Micah, I believe, where God asks the question, or maybe it's Isaiah, he says, where is your king, Israel? Where is your king? Where is your prince? He's reminding us of where we made our sins. He's reminding us where we failed and we wanted a king to lead us out into battle. And now we have Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu who was anointed to be king over Israel and it's not working. And you got Phelan that wants to step into his place that says that he can do the job, but it will not work. We have to cry out for God to send Elijah, Eliyahu, Vagam Moshe. So anyway, in this case here, the woman wanted the water from the well and everything, and so he gives her a sign to look for. He says, I'll, I'll give you water that you wouldn't have to come here no more. He said, it'd be a water springing out from your belly. Living waters. And then what does God do? What, what, what happened when Yeshua was taken out and placed on the cross? The elders of Israel took him and judged him. Moses took the elders of Israel up with him, and Moses smote him with the rod. In this case here, the rock was smitten, showing that Mashiach would be smitten. For what purpose? 
And it would be at a time when they would be arguing whether or not God was actually among them or not, just as it was 1,500 years before that time. And the rock would be smitten. And when the rock was smitten, it split down. And that was showing when God had parted Adam, it opened up his side. And when he opened up his side, he took from Ish, mean Ish, from the fire of God that was inside of there. And he brought it out and he made Isha. When this time here, though, when the rock is smitten, the waters of life were gushing out of the rock in the wilderness. No wonder why he says Hatsua. It is representing Mashiach. It is representing God himself. The Garden of Eden. It is representing what happened in the garden. It is showing us that the tree of life, Eitz Chaim, is inside of the rock. And that rock would come and would be smitten on Calvary. And when his side opened up, the life of God would come out. He was the way, the truth, and the life. All of the life, the tree of life was in him. And when his side was opened up, no wonder why the water and the blood came out. Showing that the life of God was coming out of him. I've been very lengthy with you. Because I'm trying to cover, I don't know. I don't know if people, who all else will get to hear this. Or if they'll ever listen again. My Christian brothers and sisters, let me just remind you of some things. I'm not going to do this for the sake of reading the scripture because most of you know the stories by heart. Boaz, Ruth, the, story, the book of Ruth, the story of Boaz and also of, of uh, Naomi, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, as well as Esther. Now, I've done videos on this, so many of you guys already know where I'm going with this. But if you haven't ever watched one of these videos, now you'll know why. When we look at Boaz, who is a type of Mashiach. Ruth is a type of the diaspora, excuse me, Ruth, excuse me, Naomi is a type of the diaspora. She left the homeland and she went abroad and while she was abroad, the mischief befell Israel as Israel has gone from their homeland. The, the, the mischief has befallen our people. And to, to kind of shorten the story, we know that when her sons have died, Machlon and Achilion, that Naomi is going to return. She has two daughter-in-laws, which is interesting. It types the ten virgins of, of the Christian Bible, the five, five, five foolish and the five wise. The five foolish that do stay behind, by the way, that go through the tribulation, but the five wise have all in their lamps. That is the bride. That is the bride of Moshiach. That is the Esthers of today. That is the roof of today. But anyway, they both talked a big line. They both talked about their love for, for Naomi. But when it come time to really show their colors, the, the one daughter, and it's kind of funny because I don't even remember her name. That's what's really kind of interesting. It kind of reminds me of how Yeshua must look at this as well. He's not going to remember their names because the Bible clearly says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't even know you. And that's kind of cute then uh, 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 how that, that happens to me because I can remember who Ruth is, but I can't for the life of me remember Naomi's uh, other daughter-in-law there. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Um, so at any rate, though, what we see happen here is that when Naomi decides to return home because she hears that there is uh, food in the homeland. So there again, as we see, food had been stored up and there was grain in the homeland. So she returns back with her daughter-in-law. And when she comes in, Boaz is there. And... Um, Naomi is very distraught, though, from the, the loss that she has suffered. So she tells her, her family, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. She said, but call me Mara, call me bitter. But it's, the people are happy when she comes home. And Ruth, um, she, goes, she begins to glean, according to, to Levitical law, where it was given that, we can, uh, that, the, that the stranger and the goim amongst us, uh, the people of the other nations, uh, the proselyte, they could actually take and they could uh, reap from the four corners of a field it, because we were commanded to leave those four corners standing. Now, Christian friends, this is where you come in. The returning of the Jews to their homeland is what Ruth did. She is a type of the bride of Mashiach. And her job was to help bring back the lost tribes of Israel. Not just the lost, all the tribes of Israel. 
as she gleaned from the four corners of the earth because God said he would scatter us to the four corners of the earth but he said in the last days he said I will gather you now some people like to try to say that when he says I will gather you that it's got to be Yahweh that's going to gather up the children of Israel himself but when he said to Moses I have come down and I am going to deliver my people but I am sending you in this case he points out who it is that does the deliverance but over here when God says that he's going to bring Israel back he doesn't necessarily specify it in his own words there through Isaiah through Jeremiah through Ezekiel through Zechariah through Zephaniah through Hosea and the different prophets that actually speak of the return of Israel to their homeland but in the case that we have here he does show us through the story of Ruth because Ruth begins to glean the four corners of the field and what does she do with that grain who is a type of Israel who's been scattered to the four corners of the earth she brings it back and she brings it to Naomi her mother-in-law and pours it out into her lap and all along, it begins to catch the eyes of Boaz. You know, it's funny though, Boaz's name in Hebrew, um, oh gosh, I forget exactly how they translate what his name means. Uh, I think it's rapid or something like that, like hastily. But the name actually also has a, a different root in there. Uh, it's uh, Baaz which is actually the word az is the word for goat. The beth in front of it would be be or in or in. It, it kind of makes me wonder. I, I don't know. It's kind of a little speculatory on my part probably to say this and everything. But it's like it's in the sacrifice. Remember the two goats, the scapegoat? So it's kind of interesting that Boaz has that name. I don't know if anybody's ever even thought about that before, but that's what his name, if you take the, the three letters that make up Boaz, it means in the goat or maybe in the sacrifice uh, well, it doesn't say the word sacrifice there but it is it's interesting just interesting like the scapegoat so to speak uh, but anyway so we find though that as, as, as Ruth does this and she gathers gathers this up it catches the eyes of Boaz and he begins to fall in love with her and in fact when she takes and she goes and she hides herself in the, the, the threshing floor and she puts herself and covers herself up up underneath his cover there she gets bold enough to do something that no other woman done now keep in mind the story of Esther here because when we look at the story of Esther you're going to be able to see a very similar situation that takes place when Mordecai commands her to go before the king and she says no one can go to the king unsummoned except to be deaf unless he sticks out the golden scepter before you and accepts you and Ruth is doing the exact same thing she is actually being bold enough to go into the presence of Boaz and cover herself up underneath his own blanket, she makes that approach to him. In the wee hours in the morning, Boaz wakes up. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of the story here for the sake of time, but what happens is Boaz wakes up and he sees that it's Ruth and, and, he, and he begins to talk to her and he says a very interesting thing here. He says, it's been told to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law. Isn't it interesting, the one thing that Ruth, who is a type of the bride of Mashiach, that the recognition, the one of the first words that come out of Boaz's mouth is, it's been told to me all that you've done to your mother-in-law. It was told to me all this. How the bride loves Israel. And here she is, a Mobanitis woman, a woman that is from a, uh, you know, a, an Arabic type of nation. And to love Israel, that's amazing. My wife, there's a, there is a brother that's, he's a Palestinian that converted to Christianity that loves, that loves the Jewish people. And I've watched some of his videos, a precious brother there. I, I really like it. He saw him at Benjamin Netanyahu the other day. And, and Benjamin, he was quoting where Benjamin, he said that when, the, when this one uh, Arab guy that's uh, in the Knesset, he says that we were here before you were and we will be here after you're gone. And it kind of got up under the skin of Benjamin. So Benjamin says, he says, he says no, let me correct that. He said, that is, that is a lie. He says, we were here before you were here and we will be here after you're gone. And this brother who's a Palestinian that became a Christian, I wish I could think of his name there, but he, he, he says, he says, man, I love this guy. <laughs> and so praise God, I, I agree with him. Uh, so I, I think, I see this one, I mean, this is also the time for the Palestinian. It's the time for the, for, the, for the Arab people, the Muslim people as well, to recognize who Mashiach is. Because when God turns to the Jew, your time will be over. 
Muslim or not, your time will be over. Anyway, Ruth finds favor with Boaz. And the interesting thing is, is when Boaz says to her, he says, I am a near kinsman to your, to your mother-in-law Naomi, but there is one other kinsman nearer than I am. But I will go and see if he will do the kinsman redeemer work, and if he does not do it, then I will perform it. Now, in the story of Boaz, we also find the seventh seal of Revelation, by the way, for those of you that may not know. In the Christian Bible, it speaks of the, Rev, uh, speaks of the seventh seal, uh, and that's a whole other study that I, I'm not going to be getting into right now. But there are seven seals that, that break, and each seal has a little representation. In the first uh, few seals, it talks about the horse riders that come out, which also we find uh, in the book of uh, uh, Exodus chapter 15, by the way, for those of you that would like to know. Moses actually speaks of this as well. Uh, and also in the book of Zechariah about the horse riders, or the horses as well, the horse riders. Moses talks about defeating that horse rider, by the way. Said that, uh, he says, uh, Az Yashia Moshe, uh, ga, ga, oh. he, he said, I will sing unto the Lord that he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider, showing that Moses returns and he gets victory over the Antichrist and that spirit, that devil that he rides. Uh, love that. Gosh, praise be to God. Anyway, though, with Boaz, though, what does he do? Naomi comes back. I guess I do. I need to. Let me just read to you just for a quick moment on this here. Wouldn't do it justice here to do this. Um, uh, let's see here. Naomi. All right there now. So they, they go back and um, 